Well, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our new knowledge session today. My name is Sandy Ratliff. I am with Virginia Community Capital. If you're not familiar with us, we are a community development financial institution offering financing, um, community innovation services, and investing services. Uh, we're happy to partner in this program with the Washington County Chamber of Commerce, the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator, and the town of Abington. It's hard to believe that we have been doing this program since 2014. Uh, 2014. Um, and our objective was when we started this was to support the Washington County Business Challenge, which is a competitive business um, uh, training and um, uh, incentive program, which we're getting ready to launch uh, next month. Again, it's hard to believe it's been nine years, but we want to continue helping our business owners when we started this program. And that's when we de developed this uh, uh, biweekly uh, professional development workshop series. And it's become one of the longest running uh, programs in the state of Virginia, and I'm proud of that. Um, today's session, uh, just that little make, housekeeping part, is going to be recorded for training and educational purposes. And uh, it will also be available after the session on uh, the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubators Facebook page. Uh, Virginia Community Capital's uh, Facebook page, and the we have on uh, YouTube a uh, channel called New Knowledge, where you can go there to not only see today's session, but there's probably 120 to 130 workshops available there from everything from how to start, how to market your business, social media, QuickBooks, and, and more. So um, please um, uh, take advantage of that. You'll also notice that we have everyone muted, and that is to um, beef up our security a little bit so that we won't be um, disturbed. But uh, we want to hear from you, and if you have a question for our speaker today, please post those in the Q&A or in the chat feature, and we will address those at the end of the session. Um, I'm excited today to have Andrew Darlington uh, with us uh, to talk about cybersecurity obligations just before we started this, the uh, program this morning, we were talking about how the spammers and folks are uh, very deceitful and are going to figure out ways to beat around the bush. And uh, um, hopefully Andrews can, can share with us how we can protect ourselves and uh, uh, as consumers and also as businesses, how you can protect your, your data and uh, that of your customers. Uh, Andrew was born in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, and then moved to the Tri-Cities to uh, go, uh, with a scholarship, a basketball scholarship to attend King College. Loved the area so much. And after that, he uh, uh, became a licensed insurance agent and uh, started working with uh, Heritage Insurance, where he eventually became a uh, owner uh, or partner in the agency. Uh, he, um, Andrews wanted to do more and decided that uh, in 2009, he wanted to start his own business, and that is Veritas Risk Management and Insurance Services, where he provides all kinds of insurance um, and has all kinds of credentials. And to save on time, uh, Andrew, I'm going to forego that, but he lives in the area uh, where he and his wife uh, um, uh, live in Johnson City, and he's involved in many clubs and activities in that area. And uh, he serves as an elder at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Johnson City. And uh, he and Anna have six children. And so I say the refrigerator door stays busy, but and you stay very busy. But uh, thank you so much for um, leading and sharing your knowledge with our folks today. So Andrew, I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Um, also online with us is Kathy Lowe with Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator as well. So thank you again. Thanks, Sandy and Kathy, for letting me do this. Okay, so I, let me get my screen shared here. Um, is that uh, seeable for you guys? Looks good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's get going here on Data Breach. Thanks for the introduction, Sandy, and um. We'll talk. So today is, is data breach, and I know that is an exciting topic um, for everyone. It is especially exciting for me because uh, this this topic is changing. And we talked about this in April, and um, it's changed a lot since April. There's a lot of new stuff. Uh, we're going to recap the basics, and then we are going to talk about some of the new stuff as well. So we'll get moving a little bit about me. Uh, you can pause it and look more about me. We do have a, um, a podcast, the Insurance Answer Guy, and. Uh, have a cool logo thing. I have to show that. So we'll do that. Um, so um, 
there's uh, my family. You'll have some pictures of my family interspersed. That was uh, last year. We had some good time in the snow and uh, we'll move on from there. So I do want to start, want to start this a little bit differently. And that is um, if you get nothing else out of this, nothing else, which I hope you will, but if you get nothing else, uh, the three things that you must do today to protect yourself and your organization uh, from cyber. Um, and number one, turn on multi-factor authentication. If you don't know what that is, that's where you get a text or an email or something with a code and you put it in there. Almost every email account has that available now. Please, 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 if you do nothing else from today, turn it on. That is a huge thing that will help protect you a lot, okay? Number two, um, never, ever, ever, never, ever, 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 never send money without first calling on your phone to verify. So if you get an email, a lot of times they'll get change bank accounts. Just pick up the phone, call the person, say, hey, Bob, did you change bank accounts? Is this correct? And 98% of the time they're going to say, no, I didn't. And then you've saved yourself from wiring money where you didn't need to. Uh, number three, have an IT firm work with you um, for your patches, backups, antivirus, and monitoring. Uh, it's inexpensive. I know there's a lot of partners. Uh, Jonathan Evan with Aegis IT has um, presented here before. There's a lot of folks out there that can do a great job. It's inexpensive. It's going to prevent headaches down, down, the, um, down the line. But um, so now let's get into a little bit more. But that's I want to give you some great stuff up front you can do. So um, what industry are you in? If you'll click on the chat. And um, and put that. I'm curious what kind of industries we have here um, with the with the folks. I would be uh, quite curious. We can then I can kind of give more examples uh, to those industries. So if you'll open up your chat and do that, um, we've uh, we've got. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we'll know more about that. Okay. So as we go through, uh, what is a cyber incident? Um, uh, privacy liability multi. Uh, me a wrongful act. Okay, so I'm going to read, and I'm going to read most of the time. There's some things I do need to, to read. Um, so in general terms, this means, I'll make it bigger, I'm getting old. In general terms, this means cyber extortion, data breach, funds transfer, fraud, public relations events, security failure, or systems failure, failure to disclose or unlaw, unlawfully disclose private information, doing something wrong, or being accused of doing something wrong, media content. So it is very, very broad in when we talk about cyber or privacy liability, multimedia, it is a very, very, very broad thing, okay? Um, that is um, one of the reasons why this is so important. Because it's so broad, insurance policies a lot of times aren't that broad, and so we want to talk more about that. Um, but different policies are going to cover different things, so you have to read your policy. If you don't read your policy, it's worthless. It's not like a home policy or an auto policy where you have a standard form. They're all different. OK, so while your policy may say a cyber incident, different ones are going to cover different things. So you need to make sure that the thing that you wanted covered is actually covered because it can't. I mean, we've got companies and you can do a skinny policy up to the most robust policy. And if I just said if you said, hey, I want cyber, I can give you cyber, uh, but it might not be what you need and what you do. So make sure when you're buying these policies, you ask the questions and make sure it has what it's going to have. OK, um, so question. Does anyone know anyone who personally has had a data breach? Um, plot that in the in the chat if you can. I'm, I'm curious if anybody has had that. Um, there are some cool little websites and let me see if this pops up. Let me know if you can you see that. Sandy. Kathy, can you all see that? It's a neat little website. Put in yes or no. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Okay, so um, neat little website here. Um, guess, uh, this was uh, today. Guests locked out of hotel rooms after a ransomware attack. That, that just happened today. Um, line pay exposures. One, uh, uh, over 300 websites hit by skimmers hidden inside a Google Tag Manager. So, I mean, daily, these things are coming up. I mean, this is not just a simple thing. It happens. Uh, we had one just before we did this in April. There was a ransomware attack on CNA insurance company, and we couldn't issue any bonds. Um, so it was uh, kind of wild. There's another neat website here. Uh, Panasonic had a, had a breach uh, not too long ago. And uh, GoDaddy and Robinhood, uh, 7 million users' information back on November 9th. And then the last one I'll show you here is this one. Um, 
Tulane University crime data breach exposes health records, sexual assault victims' names. I mean, things that you just don't want to happen. So it does happen on a regular basis. Okay. Um, okay. My kids. So there's a little Caleb. Um, I feel people want to look at those instead of, uh, oh, sorry. There we go. There's my little Caleb. See that instead of me. So what is cyber insurance? Okay. So cyber insurance is it's insurance to protect you from those things that we said beforehand. Um, cyber is wrong, wrongful act, a multimedia privacy liability issue. Um, do keep in mind, a lot of these policies will cover cyber only. It is best if when you are purchasing these, that you can get one that does cyber and hard copy. Um, you need to check your coverage, but dumpster diving, uh, you throw out files um, that you've scanned and are now cyber. People do that. And the dumpster diving, they can steal those files. It's still a privacy liability issue. But if you don't have that coverage under your cyber policy, you don't have any coverage for that. And you want it. And usually it's usually included, but if it's not, it's a small charge to add that back in. So I'd make sure I, I had that in front of me. Um, okay, so cyber attacks are up 400 to 500% since COVID hit. Um, does anyone know why? I'm hoping someone will start typing in there and, 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 and asking me some questions on this, but I, I'm not, not that hopeful that it's going to happen. But anyway, um, so the reason why it's happening is that um, there's more and more people on the computer. With COVID, Zoom has become huge. We're on Zoom here. Uh, you have all these other ones. So people are used to being online. People are used to getting on their computers at home for business stuff. And because of that, the, their um, internet connection is not as, as solid. Most people are not using a VPN or some type of uh, uh, encrypted uh, pathway into their work. They're just logging into a website. And so hackers can get in that very easily. More people are connecting to stuff, connecting all these different websites for work and other things from home. And then hackers have time. Uh, when hackers uh, are, have time and they're out of work, uh, people say, hey, I, I can make some money hacking and they're going to do that. And so there's opportunity. And so that's what they're going for there. Um, and yes, Sandy, exactly. Because people are home on the internet. Um, that's one of the reasons is up there. Okay, so common misconceptions about cyber insurance. Um, this is just for the big corporations uh, on the, the stuff you saw there. I mean, Tulane University, um, convenience store chains, I mean, that type of thing. But um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, there's some girl and guy in Russia sending out emails about a prince in Saudi Arabia um, who needs help getting their inheritance back. Uh, everybody's gotten those emails at some point in time, but uh, it, it's a little more sophisticated than that now. And then not only coverage if they take credit card payments um, or have protected health information. That's that's not true. We'll talk about some examples here shortly. So um, smaller companies, 200 employees are, under, are being tanked at the same rate. Um, and there's more of them. So there's more people to be tanked. Um, these large companies, they have an IT, they have a full IT department. They have several people in there. Small companies don't. They're, they're a bigger opportunity to attack. Um, the, uh, since they have no, no IT department, no dedicated IT employees, it can be there. Um, cyber policies help you with these things, which is kind of cool. Um, they give you competent people to help with these claims so that when you do have a claim, it can be quickly um, fixed. Uh, there was a story about one not too long ago. They had uh, they had inadvertently wired uh, $600,000 out. Um, it was a, I think it was a school. Uh, and uh, the cyber company was actually able to come in very quickly, um, backtrack the people who had sent the emails and that type of thing, and then actually got all but $500 back. So they can help you with this. The other thing that a lot of cyber companies will do is they'll actually scan your network for you to make sure you, to see if you have any vulnerabilities that you can give that report to your IT department, which is really, really cool. And if you want one of those uh, shoot me an email, shoot send me an email, she can send it to me. I can send you one of those reports, no charge. Um, I just need basically your domain name and I can I can get the, the report sent out to you uh, so you can see what breaches you have and vulnerabilities you've got. Um, the thing to think about when you get insurance, what you basically have is you have an insurance company. You have a, a pot of money uh, behind you to help take care of those claims so that um, you have attorneys, you have forensic experts, all that kind of stuff to help you through the process. And that's that's one of the big things you get out of this. Um, so question, do you have cyber insurance? 
Um, I, uh, I usually ask that because usually only about 30% of the folks that I, I talk to have it. And usually it's part of a, um, their property and liability policy. But if you do have one, uh, if you send us this, the name of, of the company that it's with, I can send you a comparison um, that kind of breaks down all the coverages and uh, versus different companies. It's kind of cool. Happy to send you that as well. So again, send me an email, um, send Sandy an email. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, message Sandy and we'll get, we'll get that out to you as well. Okay. There's my precious Sarah. Um, we had fun. We went to, uh, where's it? Uh, Severely, they have a, 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 um, a bird sanctuary. It's kind of cool. We went up there. That's fun. Okay. So there's some guy or girl in Russia sending out emails about a prince in Saudi Arabia. We talked about that. Um, this is a big time business. And this is one of the things I really like about this presentation that we talked about. Um, Bitcoins have gone up in price. And so usually these people um, ask for Bitcoin. And with the increase in Bitcoin pricing over the last year, uh, you're seeing a lot of the investments that these cyber criminals made have increased a lot because of the Bitcoin. And then more people are working from home under um, unprotected computers. So this is the cyber um, ecosystem supply chain. Uh, like I said, it used to be, minimize these, it used to be just one or two person people, but now, I mean, it's legitimate major industry here, okay? So you've got services, you got distribution, and you got monetization of all this stuff. Um, so you've got access brokers, hardware for sale. Um, you got cybercrime as a, as a service, ransomware. And we'll kind of talk about this, but this is this is the the industry of cybercrime now. It's 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 crazy. It's not just mom and pop anymore. So um, you talk about the access brokers. These are threat people who breach corporate networks and then sell access into a company's network. So these are the ones that you kind of think of. These are the people doing the programming and getting the, the access. And then once they get the access, they sell it. Okay. Then you have the attack tools. Um, these are groups that provide web-based panels where anyone can launch an attack against a target. So they will sell these tools that you can use and you can place into things and, and, uh, and attack people. Um, anonymity and encryption. Um, these are threat actors who sell access to private and proxy VPN, VPN networks so hackers can disguise their location. So they'll sell a, a privacy network so that people can't find them. And then they'll use that to go and hack people. Uh, phishing kits, uh, not like the phishing like you do on um, Boone Lake or Watauga Lake or wherever uh, you're fishing. But these are the kits and you can actually buy the kit. It shows you how to do a phishing um, expedition for um, emails and uh, credit card information, all that kind of stuff that you can send out and, and people bundle these and you go online and you buy them. It, it's crazy. Um, hardware for sale. These are custom made hardware, just like you, you buy a custom made computer for your, um, for your office. I just got one the other day. Um, these are custom made for doing ransomware and attacks. Um, it's, it's, they make the whole thing. Ransomware. Um, it's known as ransomware as a service or RAAS. And these groups sell ransomware strains to um, or web-based mail to people to be able to do the other things. So you have people that are specializing in different things. With those ransomware people, what happens is, so you have, um, I've got it down later, but um, you've got, uh, let's see, is it on the next slide? But you've got people and they create the ransomware strains, okay? And then you have other people that um, sell them and then broker them. And then you have the other people that have the hardware for them. It's crazy. Um, you have loaders, they install bots for you. Um, you have counter antivirus service checkers. So this is cool. This is a, it's a web portal where malware developers that are doing that ransomware can upload their samples of their malware and have it tested against um, uh, all your different uh, ones like uh, Avast and um, what, the, what do I have? I've got some type of, whatever mine are, but it tests it, it says, okay, this is going to work well against uh, Norton and this is going to work well against Avast. And this is going to work well against whoever. And it goes through and tells them what this is going to work for and they, they check it. And then you have packing. Um, these are tools that 
developers use will scramble their strains so they, they can get in the computer. So the whole thing is, is crazy where people will just kind of specialize in one little part of this and then they'll go ahead and sell that to the next part of the supply chain and just keep on making money doing it. It's, it, it's crazy. Um, you your crime distribution services, um, the groups that run the spam campaigns on social networks, um, all the stuff that you see as you scroll through Facebook and Instagram. Um, you have people that specialize in the, um, the exploit kits, um, purchase the traffic information. So when you do get the thing, they're purchasing that information or when you go to a website, they're purchasing that information um, that, that comes from. Monetization, the mule services, they offer to physically show up and pick up money. So once you've been scammed and they say, hey, you need to give us X number of dollars, you have people that will actually physically go and get the money from a certain place, or they will be the intermediary. And so the money will go to that person, they'll take a bit, and then it'll go to some place in some foreign country that you can't get your money back. Money laundering, people will then take that money, they'll launder it so it looks clean and then get it back to the person and then the reshipping fraud networks. And the last one is um, you got the uh, monetization services, group specializing in extorting victims, uh, which can be con contracted to by gangs um, in possession of stolen data. So they'll resell those things, cryptocurrency services, wire fraud. It's Don't think of this as just a mom and pop thing anymore. This is a huge industry and they're actively going out and trying to find people with open ports and those types of things that they can get into and and make money. The, the, the end goal here is usually not for fun, it's making money and how can they do that? Um, so another little thing, uh, more and more people are taking coverage. The cyber insurance market is growing at 30% a year, um, but as we'll talk more kind of then, the mar market is tightening up because there are more and more claims in uh, 2020 and 2021 have been banner year for claims. And uh, so you're starting to see more people want it because they're hearing more claims, but you're also seeing prices going up. Okay, so some mis and more miscon misconceptions. Um, I only need to take coverage if I take credit card payments. Um, ooh, I have a typing error on there. Or I have protected health information on my computers. Um, well, you do have employee information on your computer usually because uh, you have employees. You have customer information on your computer, generally speaking. Um, or you have a computer that can be used as a launch or proxy uh, to go after others, which the story of this was is really weird. So a real estate agency got sued by an e-commerce organization for its participation in a denial of service attack. So what happens, there was a small little um, real estate agency, and they kind of had a computer that they basically just used for Word documents and email. It wasn't a big thing. They just didn't use it a whole bunch. It was completely open. They didn't have any protection on it. They didn't have that IT company that was monitoring stuff. Well, what happened is a cyber company used one of their um, uh, ransomware things and thing, and they they put their that packet into this real estate agency's computer. When they did that, they um, then from that uh, real estate agency launched a cyber attack on an e-commerce firm. Uh, the e-commerce firm sued the real estate agency and others for lost revenue and cost to repair their server as a result of the damage. But they got the real estate agency because of their negligence of leaving their computer open. Uh, Mary's agency paid over $50,000 in defense costs and settled for $30,000 in loss. So they paid $80,000 when they didn't do anything except have a computer sitting there that was unprotected. Okay. So had they had an antivirus, a firewall on their computer, it might have protected them. Um, well, actually, they did have that, sorry, but they didn't put the patches in there. That's why you need the IT company to make sure they're putting the patches. Um, it, what it ended up doing is it overloaded the e-commerce site, and so that's why it went down, and that's why they got were able to get the money in the settlement on it. Um, a couple other things. We had... Um, uh, a server at, uh, at, at a company that I worked with and the server kept on getting slower over time. And it was a fairly new computer. We had it probably less than a year or two, but it kept on going and we look at it and everything looked fine. We couldn't tell anything. Finally, we had IT come in there and they had 
put it where we thought we had all this room in it, but it wasn't. They kind of made it so it looked like there was room, but there wasn't. And they were storing pornography in there from another country and then using that as the launch point to send it out to people. Okay. You just never know what's going to happen in uh, on your computer if you don't have it protected properly. We got it fixed, got it cleaned up, and hey, the computer's working well again. Um, but it's crazy what can be done if you don't have it protected. So you need to make sure that even if you don't have that stuff, if you don't have your patches, you don't have your malware, your security, and you're updating that, you're an exposure and you could still get sued even though you don't have any information of your own. It's because you're being used as a launch point, okay? So now nuts and bolts of insurance. Now, this is the exciting part. I know that y'all have been waiting pins and needles for this. And actually, I like this. I, I read these policies for fun. Uh, most people do it so they go to sleep at night. I do it to keep myself up and, and fun. So think auto insurance when you think about cyber. You uh, For an auto liability, uh, for your auto policy, okay, you have liability. Um, that's if you're driving down the road and you crunch someone. That's what we call third party. Um, you're the first party. The third party is the person you hit. Okay. So that's third party liability. Okay. So the person that has been damaged by you is third party coverage. Comprehensive and collision. I'm, it's fixing my vehicle. My vehicle's damaged. I'm getting my vehicle fixed. So that's first party coverage. I'm, I'm the first party. Okay. Then think of uh, medical payments, uh, roadside service, rental car coverage. Those are supplements that you might have for kind of some of the ancillary coverages on, on the policy. Um, then you have a deductible, deductibles you apply, and then you have exclusions. Again, very, very important. These policies are not all the same. Very few of them are the same. There's no industry standard for cyber. So almost every policy is going to have a little bit different language for their exclusions and for their coverage. Um, your common exclusions are going to be future profits, restitution, um, unjust enrichment, the cost of complying with orders, um, granting injunctive or um, equitable relief, a return or offset of fees, commissions, charges charged by um, or owned by you for goods or services already provided. Um, civil crimes can be in there. Civil penalties can be in there. Um, criminal penalties can be in there as well. Some of them are going to give back the civil, not going to get back the criminal in most situations, but you might get some, some fines you can get back. Um, damages um, for compensatory. Some do not give compensatory damages. They'll give the actual damages, but not the compensatory damages. Um, discounts, coupons, prizes um, offered, fines, um, assessments. Again, some of those fines you can get added back. But again, that's why you got to read these policies because some are going to give those coverage for those fines and some of them are not. Um, intellectual property, product recall, uh, natural disasters. Normally, it's going to be covered under other insurance, but it can still be a cyber exposure if somebody somewhere has a natural disaster which causes some damage to you which then causes damage to someone else that could be a cyber issue but again those are things you need to know and you need to make sure that you're talking to someone who actually knows cyber and not just adding it to the little property liability policy because usually those policies are very very thin and not really what you want okay next question hopefully someone will answer this um, do you think your business is more likely to have a fire or data breach? I've been looking for statistics on this and I really can't find it. Um, the statistics I see is about 8% of all businesses per year have a data breach. Um, and I really don't know, can't find the fire stuff on that. Um, anybody, what, what are y'all's thoughts? See if I've got anybody answering in chat. And we don't have anybody answering in chat. So um, I, I, we don't have a lot of fires um, in our office, we do all lines of insurance, home auto, business, work comp, general liability, everything. And we do have fires. I mean, we have a couple of usually a total loss a year, but um, we don't have a lot of that. But I know there's a lot of data breaches. Um, so uh, we'll move on from there. Okay, next one. This is my little Daniel. Um, this is a, us at the bird place. And then here's uh, the three little ones together. I've got pictures of the older ones coming along. So, okay, so again, almost all cyber policies are different. Very, very important um, because not everything's the same. And most of the policies are going to be kind of a little buffet. You're going to pick and choose what you want to add to it. And the problem that comes into there is if you don't know what you want or your agent doesn't know what you want or just um, are ignorant of what is available, 
then you're not, you might not pick those things um, because unless you know what's, what's out there, you won't know what to pick. So let's kind of start with kind of the, again, the basics here. We've got, um, yeah, Sandy, I, I do agree on the, the data is probably, um, you're going to have more likely have a data breach. Um, my personal opinion is that everybody's got a data breach. Um, you just don't know it yet. Um, it's very, very few people that don't have a data, data breach, um, but we'll get there in a second. Um, third party. So your network information security liability. Um, this is a protection to cover the expenses to defend you and any damages resulting from your liability to the third party. Now, some of them can be very, very broad in that. Um, some of them can say, we're going to defend you for X number, X liability or that type of thing. But um, th that's basic, basically there. Um, some policies will have exclusions for disgruntled ex-employees. Make sure you don't have that. That's bad. Um, disgruntled ex-employee logs back in, does some viruses and spams it out and you're in trouble. Um, or just disgruntled employees. Most do have an exclusion for company executives. So if company executive does it, usually it's going to be exclusion. So if you're getting rid of executives, you need to make sure I would talk to my attorney before you do that and talk with your cyber company before you go like go with an executive because you don't be, want to be in a situation where they do something, mess things up, and then you have no coverage. Um, the um, the credit for... Um, you can have damages, uh, credit restoration um, to people who are victims of identity uh, fraud would be there. Um, if you have uh, if you have someone who has their um, information stolen, someone opens up credit in their name and that type of thing, there needs to be damages. Um, but the, the situation you run across is someone's trying to buy a house and all of a sudden their credit score went from 750 down to 430 because all this credit has been taken out of their name because of a data breach, they've been harmed. They can't buy a house. That's where you're going to get dinged. Someone can't buy a car. Um, they can't get a job because there's companies now that if your credit score isn't above a certain amount, they're not going to hire you. And so those are where you get some really, really big lawsuits because someone's trying to get a job as an executive at Eastman. Credit score's poor. I don't know if Eastman does that, but credit score's poor. And now, that job that he's going to make $100,000 a year more, he's not getting. And it's because of a breach that you had where his information was stolen, then you're in trouble because how long is that is that revenue that he's going to miss from that $100,000 increase going to last? Um, do keep in mind, human error is the number one issue with a lot of this. Um, yes, we talked about the um, ecosystem of the, the cyber criminals, but a lot of it is just human error. Leaving your password on your computer um, emailing your password to people um, or just leaving things open, not changing passwords, not having a password. Um, we had a situation where a company printed and mailed the wrong 1099. So what they did is the 1099 printed social security number and everything for, for one person, had all that person's information, but it got mailed to someone else. That's a human error. That, that was just human error. They, they did it wrong. And so because of that, they had now a, a data breach for all their employees because they all got the wrong, um, all, all their subcontractors, because they all got the wrong 1099s, but it had personal information on all of it uh, that they got in trouble for. Um, a flash drive got thrown away in dumpsters and someone stole them and took all the information. I think that may have been a Blue Cross one. Um, but I mean, just dumb things. Don't ever throw away a flash drive. Get it uh, shredded and torn up. Um, Cool little website. I want to click here, see if it's a. Uh, there you go, Sandy. Y'all see that? Yes. Good. Okay, so this is cool. You can type in an email address. Um, and I'm typing an email address, and I'm going to hit spam now. Probably shouldn't have done that, but um, so I've been what pond or whatever. Um, so there were five data breaches that were found with mine. So. Canva, a graphic design tool, suffered a data breach that impacted 137 million subscribers. I downloaded the Canva app at one point in time uh, for some graphic design, and look, I got there. Um, this other one was uh, data enrichment exposure. Don't know what that's from. Um, 
this one is, is called exploit.in. Um, it was a combo list of um, something. It was to, to go in, it was a, it was kind of like this verifications IO where you use passwords or something. Um, my fitness pal um, had a breach and then verifications.io had a breach. So the, um, so you can type in your email address and it'll pop up and it'll show you if you had, if there's been a breach based on your email address and any of these other things. Um, so it's kind of fun to, to see what you, what you've had done. Um, regulatory defenses and penalties. Okay. So a lot of policies will exclude this, which is a big deal. Um, California has laws. Um, New York has laws. You need to make sure that if you have a cyber policy that you have coverage for this, uh, because some policies do not give full coverage for this. The reason for it is this. If you have someone that is in Tennessee or Virginia and you're working with them and then they move to California or New York, they're now a resident of that state. If they, you have a data breach where their information is breached, then you actually have to apply, uh, comply with the laws of those states for notification and that type of thing, which is a lot broader than they are in Tennessee or Virginia. So that being said, you want to make sure that you have someone else that's smarter than you and has more resources than you, an insurance company, that can do those notifications and do the things that are you're required to by law, or you're going to be in a heap big trouble because those uh, attorney generals are going to come after you. Okay. Um, these are generally speaking, um, to the extent insurable under applicable law. So if you can't insure these things, if, if some state or federal government says you can't insure X, Y, Z, no policy is going to do it. But if they'll let you, they'll generally do it. But um, and they don't they're not going to give you cost to comply with an injunctive relief. Um, uh, the cost to actually make security practices. And then um, sometimes you can get coverage for audit and reporting and compliance costs. Sometimes you can't. It depends. Um, this website here. Um, this has your data breach notification laws by state. So if you're interested in what Virginia says, you can click here and it's going to give you the Virginia code and you can see what's going on. If you need Tennessee, you can do the same thing. So it's, it's pretty cool as far as that goes. Um, so question here, is your cyber policy part of your business owner policy or is it a separate policy? Um, good question. I'd love, love for people to chime in on this one, but uh, what we see is about 50 to 60% of the people that actually have cyber, it's, it's a kind of a throw in on the property liability policy. And those are very, very, very thin policies. Uh, generally, there's no first party coverage covering yourself. It's all third party and it's going to be limited substantially on there, um, what you have. Uh, there's my uh, oldest son. Uh, that was a fun place to go. If you haven't been there, it's, it's neat. Okay, multimedia content liability. So this is protection to cover multimedia, wrongful acts such as infringement, defamation, uh, piracy, that type of thing. So social media can be excluded on some policies. Some say anything you put on social media, we're not covering, okay? Um, website liability. Uh, Tom owns a boutique hotel along the Florida coast. The hotel has a website that includes um, a section for customer feedback. Tom monitors post daily and is shocked to find a one-star review from a well-known hotel reviewer who stated, who stated that his room and the property in general were dirty and had poor customer service. Tom posted a reply on the blog that he remembered a reviewer and he was the one who was unkempt, rude, and confrontational with the staff. The reviewer sued for a million bucks for slant, for libel and intentional defam defamation defamation of character and emotional distress. Okay. So be aware of what you put on site on, on the interweb. Okay. Whether it be social media, um, your website or whatever, make sure that you have your site protected. Um, I don't know if you remember a few years back, I mentioned this in the last one, a few years back, the, um, um, a company that did websites for churches across the country got hacked. And all those churches' websites were um, turned into a um, like an ISIS website. It was crazy. Um, they got hacked in, and all of them did. And my church in Johnson City was on the news about it. Where our church, if you went to the our website at that point in time, 
it had like ISIS on it. Um, make sure you have protection over those things uh, because you don't want that stuff to get out because you can in turn get sued. Um, just uh, so just days after Mariah Carey's Twitter account was hacked by a hacker group known as Chuckling Squad, it appears um, uncut gem star Adam Sandler's had been improperly accessed as well. Um, so even Twitter accounts are getting done and you you want coverage for that because you don't want to get, again, stung on that and get in trouble. Um, yeah, I've got some other ones, but it, people go in there and it's it's a bad thing. Um, okay, so PCI fines and assessments. Okay, so, so PCI fines are where you're doing credit card processing, uh, your payment credit industry uh, stuff. Um, failure in your uh, data security breach privacy. That is um, an add-on with most companies. So if you are taking credit cards, we talked about, well, I don't need this unless I'm taking credit cards. The credit card coverage is excluded in a lot of policies unless you add, add it back. So if you are taking credit cards and you think, hey, I need this because I'm taking credit cards, you need to make sure you actually have that coverage because you don't want to get fined for not having the, pre the correct stuff in place. Um, uh, studies show that PCI compliance um, on the DS, uh, the audits were at a 75% failure rate with most companies. Okay. So these are the direct monetary fines and assessments for fraud recovery, operational expense, including credit card reissuance fees, notification of cardholders, and case management fees. So if you've got credit cards and you're using them, whether online, they're going to a website and do it in person or whatever, if you get breached and these are done, you're going to have a lot of coverage. You, I've, I've had to have my credit card replaced three or four times because of data breaches. We get a new card in the mail, like what's this for? And evidently there was a data breach. Um, so all those costs you would incur. The other thing is, and it's not covered in here, is if you do not have the um, correct security, generally speaking, your agreement with your credit card processor says, if someone wants to say that they didn't buy this, you don't have any recourse for not giving them the money back. So they have the stuff and they get their money back because they're going to say, well, I never bought this. This isn't mine. This Someone hacked me. And you're not going to be able to get your money back. So you've got no protection as a business owner to be able to get that money back if you don't have these things in place. So check with your credit card processor. If you use it, make sure that you have the things in place that you are PCI compliant to at least give you some back protection. Also, some policies are going to say, if you're not PCI compliant, then we're not going to give you coverage if you have an issue with PCI um, from, a, uh, from a data breach or a privacy violation. So again, keep that in mind. There's a lot of nuances here. It, it, this is not just, hey, go out, buy it, and I'm good. There's things that you need to know to need to know what's covered, what you want covered. Um, it's 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 it is it's a lot different than most other insurance policies. Okay. Percentage of small businesses that have cyber insurance. Um, give me a guess. What do y'all think? I'll wait a minute or two and I won't wait though. But I'll wait wait a little bit to see, see if Sandy remembers from the last time. Okay, so the answer is 30%. 30% of small businesses that have um, cyber um, got it from that website. Uh, malicious attacks were the cause of 40%, 48% of data breaches, um, which is that's a lot, it's half. But like I said, a lot of them are just utter stupidity. Um, you don't have a password. Your password's welcome one, uh, those types of things. Those are the ones that, that, that really get you. Um, here's my... Second oldest daughter, I'm having fun with birds. Uh, that was just, a, that was a fun day. We had fun for that. Um, okay, bodily injury and property damage third party. Um, this is protection for the cost of defense and damages from your liability to a third party um, results in bodily injury, physical damage. One of the things that can happen, especially if you're in production, is someone can go and hack and really mess up your production pieces, which can be a big deal, especially if you're in, um, if you do anything with manufacturing or, again, you can be a launch point to hit a manufacturer. 
Um, interesting story. One of the things that the U.S. government did, um, and I forget what country they did it to, but they did a cyber attack on a country's nuclear weapons that they were trying to create um, nuclear weapons and a nuclear program. What they did is they went in there and they made a program so that no matter what the speed of the centrifuge and the temperature, it always showed a temperature and a speed within the desired range. So they were able to get like a flash drive or something into the into there to get the um, to get the um, the virus into there. And then what it did is it turned the centrifuge really, really fast and heated it up. And they didn't know that it did because on all their monitors, it said it was within range. And then it destroyed the stuff that they were using to be able to make. And they basically had to start over on their nuclear program, uh, which is kind of cool. But that's how a virus can attack a computer and, and cause bodily injury or property damage. Um, sometimes this can come as endorsement of business owners policy generally out. Technology, you know, this is generally speaking where you are a, a someone doing um, some type of technology. You're a computer company doing um, IT work, whether it be hardware or software, that type of thing. Technology errors and emissions. Um, generally speaking, you don't want an off-the-shelf coverage for this. Uh, if you actually have that, you want a good one that's going to cover what you need. Okay. Um, first party coverage. So that's covering me. Okay, so the event of a security failure, a cyber attack, phishing attack, it protects as my losses from bodily injury, um, property damage to my stuff. So a virus gets into my computer and messes with my production machinery and it destroys my production machinery. That's the property injury and bodily injury first, first party. Um, it gets in and the emergency stop is not on on a press and some guy puts his hand in there, that emergency thing's not on, and his hand gets um, cut off. That would be bodily injury because of of, rents of some type of, of uh, IT attack. Pollution, um, again, cyber attack, something happens, and uh, the monitors on a pollution monitor don't work, and there's pollutants going out of a smokestack. There's, there's pollutants um, coming out of a uh, drain pan or something that you don't know. Uh, pollution there. Um, Question, do you think you're more likely to have a data breach now than 10 years ago? The answer is now, definitely, 100%. Um, they are up quite a bit. Um, my oldest daughter, she didn't really enjoy the birds as much as the rest of us, but um, that was still fun. Okay, computer replacement. I actually had this to happen to a client um, not too far from where you are, Sandy. Um, they got hacked, and they got hacked so bad that we had to get new computers for them. We had to get three new computers because it was... It was unrepairable. Um, so a lot of policies will do that. Fund transfer fraud. That's the big one that we talked about. You can avoid almost all this. OK, don't send money to anyone unless you call them first. That eliminates 99.99 percent of all of it. Um, so just don't do it. Um, it can also be um, if there's a hack and it automatically transfer money out. You don't see that as much. Usually it's going to be some type of what we call social engineering where they send you something and it's done. I mean, it's, and it's pretty impressive what they do. Um, I mean, they had a client, they actually sent them a email saying, Hey, our next payment, can you go ahead and change our banking information? Um, if you don't mind, we've changed you a new bank in Nashville. It was signed by the CEO of the company. It had, a new letter with the new banking information on it. So there was actual attachment on it. Everything looked a hundred percent legit. They didn't pick up the phone call. They lost 12 grand. They uh, wired them the next payment to that new bank account. Service fraud. Um, it's those types as well. Okay. Percentage of small businesses that experience a cyber incident, um, that would be 10%. 20% of all claims are from just simple mistakes that people made, not necessarily getting done, being torched.
And there is my beautiful bride. Uh, she was enjoying the the the, uh, the birds there. Okay, digital asset restoration. Um, protection for the lost uh, cost to replace, restore, or recreate your digital assets that are damaged. So uh, computers are stolen. You got to recreate all that data in there. Um, they steal the data. You got to recreate it. Um, all those data entry costs, that type of thing, can be included in there. So that's a, a good thing to have. Business interruption. Okay, so your business can't operate. You're an e-commerce com company. You've been hacked. Your servers are down. You don't know what to happen. They've stolen. They've done everything. You're down. You're not making any money because your e-commerce is down. Imagine having that happen right now in the middle of Christmas. Um, bad things. Uh, you want to make sure that you have that if you're doing anything with a computer. Uh, I mean, for me, I'm on computer almost all day long, every day. Um, praise the Lord. If something does happen to us, we can go to Best Buy and get a computer and be done. Um, but there's business that, that can't. Um, your uh, POS system's down and you can't check out stuff. Your retail store, you can't, you can't check out stuff. What do you do? Uh, that would be this business interruption coverage. Um, business interruption, it doesn't pay your gross revenue. It's the net profit is what you get paid. Some of them will continue to pay your employees while they're off. Um, some of them don't. Again, they're all different. That's why you need to know these things. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, and I, I, I'd like to stop and if we can open up the, the, the conversation, Sandy, here in a second. On this, I'd like to. But cyber extortion slash ransomware, okay? This covers the cost to respond to an extortion incident, including money, securities, and even virtual currencies paid. OK, so many times um, this is an add on uh, to your policy, but negotiation and getting funds um, in the correct form in the right places. So um, if you get ransomware and they're doing it cyber extortion, then um, what they're going to do is they're generally going to have you give them some type of um, or they're going to lock up your computer. You're going to get a screen that says, hey, send Bitcoin to this address and then we'll unlock your computer. You got 24 hours to do it, 48 hours to do it, whatever. Um, generally it's not take a bag of money to the trash dumpster be, behind the um, old oak tree in the city park. Um, it's usually Bitcoin. Um, the nice thing about having a, a policy like this is that they will actually help you get the money together, show you how to get a Bitcoin account, send them the Bitcoin money and get it back. Interestingly enough, most of the ransomware companies that are doing this, they are now companies, um, they have great customer service. And this is where we're, I'd like to have the discussion. They have such great customer service because they know if they don't give the key back for you to be able to get your data back, everybody's going to stop paying ransoms because they're like, if I pay it, I don't get my stuff back. If I don't pay it, I get my stuff back. Why pay it? So I guess the, the discussion I want to have about is this. Should policies actually cover ransomware? Because the argument is made, Sandy, I'm going to pick on you because I can see you and you can talk. Um, if I cover ransomware and if I'm a ransomware maker and I hack Sandy and she has ransomware coverage and I can get $25,000, then great. I just made $25,000. Now I'm going to go to Kathy and I'm going to ransomware her and I'm going to get $25,000 for her. And so all you are is giving the criminals an ex, uh, a reason to hack and to put computers at ransom. If you completely stop it, Sandy, tough, you lost your stuff. But you think they're going to go after Kathy now? If no policy, if they said there are no more policies can cover any ransomware, do you think it would stop it? And that, uh, I mean, just, just curious your thoughts on that. Anybody? <laughs> Um, I think that they're looking for money any way they can. And um, if there's a slight chance that they can get it from Kathy too, they're going to. Yeah. But if they, if they made a law or if all the insurance companies got together and said, we're not going to cover ransomware at all. So no policy is going to cover any ransomware. Do you think that would reduce the amount of ransomware? No. Not at all. So you, you think there'll be people that it's not covered, but they go ahead and write the check and be done with it? I think so. I mean, I, I, I again, these criminals have got it figured out. They're going to try to get the money out of you one way or the other. It's just going to make it easier for the customer uh, or to, uh, I guess, 
not be hit so financially by having the ransomware, but I don't think that's going to stop it. They haven't stopped the do not call. <laughs> well, l- let me give you an example. Um, mission, most every mission organization in the world has a unspoken or some spoken rule that no ransom will ever be paid for any missionary. If they get captured, no ransom is going to be paid. Period, end of story, no questions asked. There will not be pay- ransom paid. We had a friend of ours um, that was captured in Indonesia. Um, she was all over the news um, about 10 years ago-ish. Um, other people that were Americans had gotten captured and ransom had paid and been released. They were with a mission organization. They did not, no ransom, no ransoms paid. But what it's done throughout the years, um, and the reason they got captured is because they were in a resort with a bunch of other Americans. But what it's done throughout the years is, generally speaking, these criminals do not capture missionaries because they know that they have to put up with someone and they're not going to get paid. Now, they'll capture diplomats and that type of thing because they'll, those will pay. But missionaries are generally that uh, pretty easily done because these organizations know it's not worth our time to capture a missionary because we're not going to make anything. And so I'm just wondering if, if they say, Hey, no one's going to do it. We're stopping. If that would say, you know what, we're not going to do ransomware. There's other things we can do. We can sell credit card information. We can do other things, but we're going to stop doing ransomware because there's no money in it. And that, that, that's my thought. I mean, actually there's some in the industry that have, have said that. And so I, Will that ever happen? I don't know, because I think some opportunist insurance company will say, hey, we're going to offer cyber. And then they, they'll take a lot of the market. Um, it would have to be a fell swoop. But it, it's still a, a something that's going on in the industry right now as a, as a, to, as a topic of can we do this? So yeah, I, I like your point, Sandy. I mean, even if insurance companies didn't do it, the person would pay it. So that's not going to make anybody... Um, not not take the, the cyber. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, breach response crisis management public relations repair. So if you get a breach, people are going to say bad things about you. And um, so that's a bad thing. Uh, usually these policies are going to have some money for uh, crisis management, for PR services, that type of thing, to restore your reputation. Worldwide coverage, um, protection from fines and penalties from other governmental agencies, not just U.S., that is important. So some policies only cover U.S. Um, if you get fined because of something that happened that has damaged people in Canada and you get fined by the Canadian government or French government, or whoever, you might want coverage for that. Um, and wrapping up, cyber insurance for wrap up, uh, Outlook. Um, this is a big deal now. So uh, what we're seeing, cyber insurance providers are seeing substantial increase in the average paid loss for policyholders following a cyber incident. A May 21 report by Fitch Ratings, the average loss increased from $145,000 to $358,000 in 2022. 247% increase on that. That's huge. I mean, huge. Um, The industries that are getting hardest hit by cybercrime are seeing premium increases as high as 300%. Got a client we just picked up, his premium last year was... 3,000 bucks, his renewal premium was $12,000, dollars $11,000, uh, on a cyber. Um, we were able to get it for seven, uh, but still he, he took a 150% increase going with us and he was thrilled. Um, and then even with the right cybersecurity controls in place, organizations are finding it impossible to secure coverage. There's some, some, uh, it niches that getting it is almost impossible. Um, and so, this is becoming a big deal. If you have cyber right now, expect a large rate increase, period. Um, what they're saying is you're going to have large rate increases. You've got um, some of them are cutting back coverage and a rate increase, and you're seeing a lot of that. Okay. Insurers that were more eager to issue $5 million cyber liability limits in the past now cutting back to one to three million limits. So you can't get as much coverage as you would have wanted. And then this is a big thing um, increases are not being impacted by strong securities control and no prior claims. They are some, but the thing is that you're getting is you don't get coverage. It's not that you just pay a prior premium. You're not getting coverage unless you have these things in place. If you have 
holes in your in your system. You don't have backups. You don't have this. They're saying, you know, we don't we don't want you because there's too many programs out there that can find those holes quickly and attack those computers, and you got an instant claim. And so, because of that, just getting coverage is, is rough. Okay. Um, last thing, um, we have a cyber risk exposure uh, scorecard. Um, it will help you determine your level of risk. If you want that, email me. Um, it's a neat little thing, kind of a checkbox and says, okay, you're at this exposure. We can get that. Um, a cybersecurity planning guide um, gives you a roadmap setting up a, cyber, a good cybersecurity program for your company. And then um, also, if you mention this, we'll give you our cyber risk assessment of your company. Um, just email us. Um, I need the domain name and we can provide that to you. Uh, dark web check and uh, get your report on that. It's, it's pretty slick. You take it to your IT company. They um, show you exactly what uh, what needs to happen and they can fix that stuff for you. Um, uh, no obligation. If you need that, just let us know. Happy to happy to provide that as well. And at, at that, oh, there's my contact information. I guess that's important. Uh, feel free to email me, spam me, um, send me your notifications from your Saudi Arabia prince who needs money for their king and Uganda, and um, I'll respond with my banking, accounting, and routing information for you. So thanks, Andy. Yes, and you believe in Santa Claus, too. I do. <laughs> I, I do. And uh, my kids are watching, so I definitely <laughs> believe in Santa Claus. Uh, for our guests, I have unmuted or given you an opportunity that if you want to ask a question of uh, Andrew, feel free to do it or put it in the chat. But I've got some questions if that's allowed. Go for it. Um, I, I guess at the beginning that you were talking about policies and so forth, and it made me think about uh, employee handbooks and having something in employee um, uh, guidelines that would cover cyber policies and uh, I guess what it leads to is if I have an employee that does something absolutely asinine that causes a major data breach that costs my organization big money that we don't have, is there a way that I can penalize that employee for that financial hit uh, because they signed, they went through the training, they signed the guidelines and they just did something crazy or is it just something that's part of doing business? Like any good HR person, the answer is maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, I mean you can um, you can dock people's pay for certain things. Um, do keep in mind that uh, subject to FLSA regulations, the Fair Labor Standards Act, you cannot dock below minimum wage in most situations. So, um, if someone costs you a thousand dollars to to make a fix, and they work forty hours, and their paycheck was supposed to be $1,100, you can't give them a hundred bucks. Um, you have to make sure they get at least minimum wage, but you can dock stuff. Put it in your handbook, um, document it, and um, and you can do it. We, I mean, there's there's situations where people do dock people for pay for certain things, um, breaking equipment. If you, uh, contractors will do that, uh, you break a, a piece of equipment, um, that's your responsibility. You have to pay it back. You're going to pay it back over the course of three months or five months or whatever, but you can dock that. I mean, um, a lot of insurance agencies, um, if you cause a, uh, professional liability claim, you're going to eat part of the, part of the claim, uh, deductible. So, so that is not uncommon. Um, just make sure you do it properly. Check with a, a good labor law attorney, um, or someone that slept at Holiday Inn last night and you should be fine. Gotcha. Um, Kathy and I both work with, uh, new and existing businesses in, in the region. And I'm just curious, as they work on a business plan or start working on their annual budget, is there an average amount uh, that a business should actually put into their budget of what it's going to cost them to, I guess, either insurance? I'm, I know you're going to say one size does not fit all, but just some basics of, you know, plan on this much for um, computer, um, uh, uh, you know, the awesome. malware awesome. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just so they have an idea of what they should start including. Yeah. So um, in general speaking, uh, you, if you have a little business owner's policy or small business under five employees um, and you have a little business owner's policy from you name XYZ company, a lot of times you can get a little add on for 50 to 100 bucks a year. 
um, for a decent amount of cyber. When I say decent, uh, fifty to hundred thousand dollars of coverage, um, you can get that. Uh, most of those little policies are throwing in ten thousand automatically, so you've at least got something there. Um, but you can, um, I mean, we can we can do a top notch policy for a small company for five hundred bucks, I and mean, it's going everything you'd want, and you can get a good policy for a hundred bucks. Um, that is, is a good solid policy. So what I would say is depending on your exposure. Now, I just got through saying that everybody has a big exposure, but there are industries that are, are hit more often. If you're in professional services, financial, you need something. I mean, that's you're, you're foolish if you don't have a, a, a solid policy. If you're in manufacturing um, and you just have a computer there and you're doing some CAD drawings or, or that like or, or, or the like, then yes, you need a policy you can probably budget under hundred bucks a year for that. Um, as you start to grow, um, it, can, it can increase quite a bit. Generally speaking, your premium is going based on revenue. So even if you're in a tough industry, if your revenues are low, it's not going to be that, that expensive. Most of the policies that we sell are a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks for the year for the small business um, and, and less. Um, but that being said, rates are going up and they're going to be going up substantially. So you're going to have to cut back coverage um, and there, so small businesses budget hundred bucks. As you start to grow, you'll probably end up being somewhere in thousand dollar range over the next few years as you grow. Yeah. After you gave that, that example of the gentleman where his insurance was about 2000 and then it, it, uh, jumped up to heart attack level. I think it really shows all the more reasons that, uh, small business owners, a need to train their employees how to be careful, even with if I issue a, you a credit card, you know, there's some things that you as the person I'm giving it to should have some responsibility to uh, make sure you get those patches done uh, on your computers, get those uh, patched. And we know a, a good IT guy that can help. And just to be extra careful, because I don't think it's going to decrease uh, anytime soon as we continue to move to an online um, commerce. Uh, I mean, we learn from, just, you know, some of the folks that, that Kathy and I work with, you know, when COVID hit, they had a main street business. It just wiped, it just dried up. They have all this inventory, but nobody's coming through the door. So, you know, we started doing workshops on how do you set up an e-commerce, um, change your website into where you can take online because you've, you've got to get that inventory out. You're not going to be able to pay your insurance bill, uh, let alone your, uh, your electric and, and uh, IT. But uh, Well, and, uh, and the, I mean, the biggest thing I said at the beginning, multi-factor authentication. Everybody's got email at work. Get it. I mean, it's huge. Um, Google's less hacked than Microsoft 360. So do keep that in mind. But um, you, you, you've got to have that multi-factor authentication on your own bank accounts, on your email, anything that allows it, get it. Because th that, that's one of the biggest things you can do to protect yourself. Great, good, good suggestion. Well, I don't see any quest uh, additional questions, but uh, I'd like to thank you, Andrew, again, for your time and sharing your expertise with all of us. Um, I, I learned a lot and made me start thinking just on my uh, myself, how to be more careful, but uh, as I work with other businesses uh, to help them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, today's session is being recorded and it'll be available on the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubators Facebook page. Um, and we have a YouTube channel called New Knowledge that you can go there to, and find that one and probably 120 plus more. Um, just want to put a plug in. Uh, we will get back after the holidays. Uh, we will... Uh, our next session is going to be on January the 12th, and Gary McGow with uh, the uh, Bristol Chamber uh, Entrepreneur Center is going to be leading a session on the key elements of a business plan, and uh, I don't care if you're an existing business, um, uh, I think you're going to find some information good on that because you may want to be looking at expanding your business and do a little bit better at managing it, but uh, especially if you're starting a business, I tell everybody there's no reason to start it if you don't have some kind of plan or how you're going to, to manage it and uh, grow it. So uh, plan to join us on uh, January the 12th. Um, and um, uh, thanks again. And Andrew, we couldn't do it without you and, and professionals like yourself who donate your time to share. So uh, um, thanks again and um, Merry Christmas, everybody.
Thanks, Sandy. Merry Christmas. Take care. Bye-bye.